Well, the federal and provincial governments of Canada have 12 months to respond to the recent Supreme Court decision striking down a ban on euthanasia. It reflects a trend seen across North America and around the world. As nations move to legalize the practice, leading medical and science ethicist Dr. Margaret Somerville has weighed in with her expertise on how best to approach end-of-life scenarios. Thank you so much for coming to talk about this. Pleasure, sure. It's such a um, It's such a topic that's so close to so many people's hearts because they see their friends and family, their parents, they've seen them die. And many times, you know, we have that instinct, we want to end suffering. So how do you even begin to approach this topic? It's so emotionally fraught. Well, I think the first thing is that, and it's a place where we can all agree and begin, is that we all agree that everybody who needs it should have access to fully adequate palliative care. And currently in Canada, only about 16 to 30 percent of people have that access, and that's wow. appalling. I and, did not know that. Yeah, and I've I've actually written that I believe that's a breach of fundamental human rights, uh, because the fully adequate palliative care includes fully adequate pain management, and um, and relief of other suffering. But but the difference between that and euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide is that you don't intentionally shorten the patient's life. You look after the patient, you keep them as comfortable as possible. There are a few cases where you can't relieve the pain, then you can use the process that's called palliative sedation, where the person is given sedation so that they don't consciously experience the pain, but you're not killing them, you're relieving their suffering. And uh, so I think we begin there, but there's a uh, there are people and you know what we see in the surveys is a very large percentage of Canadians agree with the so-called uh, physician assisted death which is a euphemism which I think doesn't make us react the way we ought to so I don't call it physician assisted death I call it physicians uh, helping their patients to kill themselves that is suicide or uh, physicians administering a lethal injection, that is physicians killing their patients. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about do we really want that, and um, it seems as though the Supreme Court has said, well, yes, as long as you've got certain safeguards, that might be, that is okay, or, it's, or they've said it's contrary to the Charter of Rights not to allow it, um, with all respect to the Supreme Court of Canada, because I am a lawyer, <laughs> I, I really, I, I'm just really devastated by this judgment. I think it's terrible. Well, and you've been studying this topic for decades. You've written a book on it called Death Talk. You lecture on it at McGill University. I mean, this is something so close to your heart that you've argued. And you've, you've seen that shift over these decades in society where we would not have considered that, and now we, we can. Why do you think our attitudes are changing? Essentially, the euthanasia debate is a conflict of two values. It's a conflict of the value of individual autonomy. It's my life, my body. I've got the right to do what I want, including if I want to be dead, I want to be made dead. Uh, and the value of respect for human life. And that value operates at two levels. It requires respect for every individual human life but it also requires respect for human life in general at the societal level. Now, even if you said, well, letting people choose to have a lethal injection, let's say, even if you said, well, that's, um, that's not an infringement of individual respect for life because that person's chosen it. I don't agree with that, but this would be the argument. You still have that problem that you are not respecting human life in society in general because you've got, you're changing the law to authorise this and you're allowing doctors to actually kill their patients. Mm. And paradoxically, in a secular society, which is what we are in Canada, that means we're not based on a religious, on a religion, um, then, which doesn't mean that you can exclude religion. That's a very different thing. You have to make that distinction. But in a secular society, the two main institutions that carry the value of respect for life for society as a whole are law, which says you must not kill, and medicine, which says for two and a half thousand years, medicine has said you cure where possible, you care always, you never kill as a physician. And we're changing that.
I mean, it's extraordinarily serious. I believe it's the single most important values decision of the 21st century. I think future generations looking back at us will say, I hope they'll say, why did they do it? And we, we, we've gone back to what we should have kept. Uh, but I don't know whether they will. Well, when you articulate your concerns about this, it's so interesting because as you talked about that individual autonomy, which is kind of driving this movement, you look at it in terms of the greater good for the community and you see this as harming the community in a way that maybe we don't even realize. Talk to me about that, like for future generations, what, yeah. what could change because of this? Well, you know, we know, for example, that everybody's worried about healthcare costs and we know that uh, on average, a person uses 50% um, of their lifetime health care costs are spent in the last six months of their lives. Hmm. Uh, yesterday, there was a story on the front page of the National Post that said in the last, I think it was week or two weeks of life, the average Canadian costs $14,000 in health care. Now, if you've got lethal injections available, how do you reduce your health care costs? And it used to be that when I would say something like, well, this will be used to save health care costs, everybody would say, oh, you're being hysterical. It would, it would never be used for that. It's only for suffering. It's only people who want it. Well, now people are talking about we. this is something that's needed because of health care costs. I was teaching a medical class. This is just quite recently. And the students were, were all, will all be graduating this May. They'll all be Dr. So-and-so this May. And one of the young men in the class, uh, when I, I gave the, the lecture was on euthanasia, and I said, no, it's a really bad idea, and we can't have physicians doing this. And uh, he said, but you, you've got to understand. He said, we can't afford our health care system. Unless we can have euthanasia, we're going, we, we won't be able to be, have the health care that we need for other people. And so that is becoming something that's talked about. Not only that, it was always said that if this was legalised, it would only be competent, consenting adults who were in terrible suffering and terminally ill. Mm -hmm. Now we see in both Belgium and the Netherlands that none of those conditions apply. Um, we have also see in the two reports that were used in the Carter case in the Supreme Court of Canada, one of them was the Royal Society of Canada report and one of them was the Quebec uh, Government Legislative Committee report. Both of those reports said, well, we, we're just dealing with one issue here about, you know, competent adults and we're not, we will discuss people with Alzheimer's disease later on. So they didn't say, no, we would never do this to people with Alzheimer's disease. And what we know is that in the Netherlands and Belgium, people without dementia, Alzheimer's disease, are being euthanised. In the Netherlands now, uh, if you have a disabled baby, the parents can requ request that it be euthanised. Mm. Uh, and that's... All and, sorts of... I mean, and that's the big concern, right? I mean, people that are vulnerable, whether um, they're disabled or they're not in a position at that time to make a decision about their life or death, that just... People are worried that someone else is going to decide, and all about quality of life, someone else is going to decide that their quality of life is not good enough and so they're going to take them away. But maybe you don't actually feel that. Maybe you feel like you're just happy to be alive, even if you're suffering, but you may not have a voice in that debate. That's a worry. Um, we know from research that when you get a healthcare professionals to assess somebody's quality of life, they put, they will, let's say they put it very low in the group that they look at, particularly when they're old, frail people. And then when you do the same test, asking the people themselves where their quality of life fits on this scale, they put it much higher quality of life than the healthcare professionals. But Cheryl, I don't just object to this because it could be abused or because, you know, it will be used in situations where you would not want it to extend to. I object to it too because it's, I think it's fundamentally wrong. I think it's fundamentally wrong to intentionally kill another person. And of course we agree with you, and I agree with you as well. Uh, but, you know, how do you talk about that to someone who doesn't believe that it's fundamentally wrong? And, you know, as I said at the beginning, it's emotionally fraught. So I, I've talked to a lot of people who do believe it's wrong to kill, but may have a loved one that is in indescribable suffering. Yeah. And 
depression and you know it's just it's it's torture literally to watch that person suffer and they start even questioning the fact that they think it's fundamentally wrong to kill how do you overcome that because this is really a, com a compassionate heartbreaking yeah. issue yeah yeah i know i know i mean i was lecturing my law students this time and out of a class of 40 only one of them agreed with me that euthanasia was wrong so i mean i face that's an issue that i face and when i came away from the class I felt really distressed. I thought, um, you know, I've done a terrible job of trying to get them to see why it's wrong. So I wrote um, a letter to them, sent it by email, and I said, you know, I've obviously failed to to convey to you what I, I why I believe this is so wrong. And one of them wrote back to me, very thoughtful letter, and she said, no, she said, you did convey it, but she said, that's not the problem. She said, for us, Suffering is the greatest of all evils. Mm -hmm. And anything that we could do to relieve suffering is a lesser evil. And that's why, even though we think it's not good or it's wrong, it's a lesser wrong than letting somebody suffer. So the answer to that is that we've got to do something. First of all, we've got to do everything we can to relieve suffering. We've got a wonderful psychiatrist here in Canada called Dr. Harvey Max Chochinoff. And you should have him on the program sometime. Mm. Um, and he's in Manitoba and he specialises in psychiatry of dying people. And he and his colleagues have developed these protocols and these psychiatric interventions that um, can help people to come to terms with what's happening to them. And they have amazing results where people can actually be helped and they feel better. And, of course, we've got to have physical suffering relief. I mean, I've, see, I've had a brother who died and he was in terrible pain and I practically had to go hysterical to get the pain treatment he needed. I mean, that's the problem. And we shouldn't be killing people instead of caring for them. When the Supreme Court overturned the ban here in Canada, they said it wasn't just for physical people who are dying, but it was also for psychological yeah. pain. And, you know, the thing is, sometimes when you're suffering with a disease or you're fighting through a disease, you have moments where you want to kill yourself. You have moments, or even with a shock and the trauma of realizing you have a disease or you're missing a limb or whatever that trauma is in your life, sometimes you go through a season where you want to die, but that season may not last. And the thing about euthanasia is it's permanent. You yeah. cannot go back from that decision and you don't have the opportunity to go into that next season you know, where but hope also, lives again. Cheryl, the other thing you've got to think about is if the basis for allowing this is autonomy, it's my life, it's my choice, why then shouldn't, for whatever reason it is you want to die, why shouldn't you be allowed to do it? And in actual fact, what they're discussing in the Netherlands is that if you're over 70 and tired of life is the term, then you want euthanasia? Maybe you can have it. They haven't decided yet, but that, that is being serious. That's leading. where the argument leads in a way, in a well, sense, does, right? The does. logical outcome of the argument. And what if you're a, you feel like you're a burden to your family and maybe you don't want to die, but you just don't want to see your kids suffer? Well, that's and another thing. You feel that pressure or like yeah. the pressure of, of, you know, costing the government so much money. But also, what about the message that if you are suffering, and suffering is the greatest evil, and you can have a lethal injection and suicide is, is an appropriate response to the relief of suffering. What does that do to all of our anti-suicide campaigns and the people who work in that, trying to help people not to take their lives? There's no consistency in our logic, basically, is what well, you're saying. Well, and what we also know, I mean, Oregon in the United States, uh, it's four or five states in the United States have got legalised physician-assisted suicide. None of them have got euthanasia. One, one of the things in Oregon is, you know, everybody says, oh, no, it's fine, it's safe and that. But their non-medical suicide rate, this is just ordinary old common garden suicide, is now the highest per head of population in the United States. So you could argue that, you know, this sends a message that suicide is an appropriate response to suffering. We're so thankful that you are saying what you're saying. I realize that it's not always popular and sometimes you take a lot of flack for what you have to say. <laughs> but I think it's important. And, you know, I wanted to end with a quote from you oh. that I absolutely <laughs> loved because I thought it was uh, so beautiful. You said that normalizing euthanasia would destroy a sense of the unfathomable mystery of life and seriously damage our human spirit, or especially our capacity to find meaning in life. I think that's kind of the undefinable thing yeah. that, that creating a culture of death in our society 
does that, that is harder for you to explain that you know you're maybe in some ways with your student you're struggling to help them to understand yeah. you see if you don't see any mystery in death then you probably find it very hard to find a mystery in life and then you open up a whole lot of other issues as well well if there's no mystery why shouldn't we for example we had a talk about embryos why shouldn't we use human embryos nothing special about them just a bit of human life you know mm -hmm. you know people have value no matter what their age and where they are in life and god has a purpose for everyone's life and that's i guess that's what we're always going to be saying it, it may not be in your realm but it's it, there's a truth in it that gives value and dignity to people and we always want to make sure we do that that no one ever feels useless or hopeless or done whatever they're going through. Yeah, you're right. But, but you can't necessarily attribute it just to God. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Certainly not in your field. But thank you so much for all that you do to speak on this topic and to fight for those values. And really, I think you send up a warning signal about where are we headed as a society and what will be the ultimate consequences of this. So we just cheer you on, keep speaking, and just know that you have a lot of fans here. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. <laughs>